Hello, so this is the, the third lecture on commutative geometry. And uh, good news, we have, uh, we have axioms at the end. So we'll finish the, the work started in the first two lectures by looking at these uh, basic geometries that we know, real and complex, and then their free analogs that we're uh, starting to build somehow. And uh, we'll uh, somehow complete the, um, the work there with the missing arrows between these spheres, tori, unitary groups, and uh, reflection groups. So let's find this uh, presentation. Okay, so non-commutative algebraic geometry. Uh, as I told you, well, this is mostly algebraic, but uh, in the end it's gonna become rather Riemannian because we'll uh, start integrating and everything. But this is a priori something, uh, something algebraic that we're doing. So what's the plan? Uh, so as I told you, uh, there is no free RN, free CM, so that's why we have to go one level below the main object, which is uh, the space where everything lives, and restrict attention to the basic objects below that space. And these are the spheres, right? That's the most basic object you can think of. Sphere, torus, also very basic, unitary group and reflection group. So our idea is to axiomatize the how many 12 correspondences between these objects for the basic geometries, real and complex, where we know them very well. But also free real and free complex, these are somehow the most important ones. And uh, well, we'll see how this, uh, these things work. Last time we already saw that there are some problems in constructing some of the arrows. We get to some, uh, into some weird phenomena involving twists. We'll see uh, more things today. And once we'll finish this work for the four main examples, we'll be able to come up with some axioms. So uh, some details now. So you see, we're dealing at the same time, I mean, with real and complex and, uh, and classical and free. So in what follows, uh, we'll just call no commutative sphere, sphere anything between the classical real sphere, somehow the smallest one, and the free complex one, the biggest one. Same for the torus, same for the unitary group, and same for the reflection group. So this, uh, this leaves somehow everything that we're doing, the geometries that we're trying to axiomatize, live between Rn, the smallest one, and between C and plus, if you want the free complex geometry. So this will uh, be somehow our terminology here for STUK. S is assumed to be algebraic, I mean, coming from some uh, polynomial relations. And TUK must be quantum groups, of course, compacts. And here you see just a remark about T. So uh, this lives between uh, TN, the real torus, that's the cube, it's Z2 to the N or the dual of Z2 to the N, if you want. And Tn plus is the dual of the free group on N generators. So T lives between two group duals, it must be a group dual. So uh, when you look at this, what's the simplest object? Uh, well, the thing is that you'd like to say that is the sphere, but <laughs> What's a non commutative sphere? What are the axioms to be imposed or it's on it? It's not very clear finally. And uh, on the other hand, I say that is the torus because, after all, it's just a group dual, so it's two group theory. But if you look at discrete group theory, uh, what are the axioms for on a group such that the corresponding dual should correspond to a non commutative geometry? Once again, you don't get answered there despite the fact that group theory is old as, uh, as the world and uh, they know everything, but these kind of things, they don't know it. So uh, it's not either. And uh, well, UK actually, these are the most recent things and most technical, but we'll see later on when doing classification and all that, that uh, actually U and K are, uh, are actually somehow the, the simplest objects. Well, we'll see all this. So, uh, there are some details now. Uh, there are some comments, maybe. But yeah, we're mixing here classical and free, and also real and complex. So is this a good idea? Maybe we should uh, 
split somehow things and uh, first of all it is good to mix classical and free and uh, this is definitely because uh, we'll see later there are many uh, very interesting intermediate things between classical and free such as for instance the half classical uh, geometry where the coordinates satisfy this relation say bc cba and there are, uh, there are perhaps some more I mean, depending on uh, the exact axiom so uh, this is very interesting uh, we definitely don't want to miss that now the second question which is maybe more uh, yeah it's more important more well found and somehow it's a good idea to mix real and complex I mean, let's go to the previous slide so you see why not trying to do things in real putting let's say the free real things here and separately the things in complex so you see this definition somehow is a, something hybrid between real and complex so do we really want that and the answer is yes because uh, of course in the classical case you don't want that i mean um, there's nothing interesting between real and complex but in the free case somehow real and complex uh, um, are very related one result, for instance, we'll talk about it later, is that the projective spaces, real, free, and complex free, coincide. So that's something well known. I mean, it's been there for uh, 25 years. And, uh, that's something I did in my thesis actually long ago that uh, one plus, u and plus have the same uh, projective versions. Projective version, one of them appears as uh, complex, free complexification of the other. That was in my thesis. And, uh, so this is uh, this is very strange. I mean, um, so all that what we're doing here is uh, fine, but uh, in projective you have real complex and then free, which is not real nor complex. So the scalars here, there, they are not really real or complex. They are mixed. So uh, that's why even in the affine case, it's a, it's a good thing to look at the the hybrid situation, like in the previous slide. You see, between real and complex. Because uh, yeah, in the free case, things are uh, it's somehow scalarless. At least the projective theory. So our knowledge about R and C being different things disappears there. So this is a bit of a miracle. And uh, well, we're doing some kind of quantum mechanics, right? There are many miracles there, and no one really know, knows what's the field there. If it's R or C. Well, okay. So more on this later. Now uh, let's get started. So what uh, do we have? Let's uh, remind what we have from the last time. So we have these four quadruplets, real complex, pre-real, free complex. And uh, so we want to construct arrows. We have so far four arrows. So the downwards ones are these quantum isometry constructions we're talking about. Uh, in the unitary group appears as quantum isometry group of the sphere. And the reflection group appears as the reflection group of the torus. Although it's not an isometry group, that's wrong in the free case. We got into these twists and everything. So uh, these are the vertical correspondences, and the horizontal ones are just clear. I mean, they just uh, intersect with the uh, with the big torus here, the sphere, with Tn plus this Tn plus here, and we get the corresponding uh, tori. And same here on the bottom, you just intersect the big reflection group Ken plus and you get uh, your individual reflection groups. So, uh, what to do first? I mean, uh, we have uh, 12 arrows, we have four of them, so what's the simplest one? And the simplest thing is actually to get the torus from uh, ON or HN, or in general. Yeah, to get the torus T from U and from K. So that's the so-called diagonal torus construction. It's very elementary, so let's start with this. So, uh, given uh, I take a quantum group, arbitrary quantum group, and I just uh, take the diagonal, I mean, kill everything else. Say that they are zero, the ij's are zero, I define from j. So I get a quotient, quotient being a quantum subgroup, if you want. Now, let's look at this uh, quotient. My claim is that this is a group dual. So, why? Because uh, you see the generators here, so we, uh, we kill the orthogonal part. So the generators are this UII that I can recall, uh, I can call GI, and they are unitaries, okay? 
Also, delta of gi, well, is obtained from this formula by plugging in i is j. But here on the right, those diagonal things vanish. So I'm just left with gi tensor gi. So now in hope algebra parlance, this means what do I have? Unitary, which is group like. So I get a group dual. So uh, yeah, C of t is uh, C star of lambda, if you want, lambda being the, the group generated by g and g n inside the quotients. OK, so conclusion, this are, uh, we get in this way something called diagonal torus. Usually tori, we, we call somehow tori the, the group dwarfs in general. So let's see how this construction works now for our uh, quantum groups, and it just works fine. So uh, for the unitary ones, we get what we want, the corresponding tori. And for the reflection subgroups, we get exactly the same tori. So is this true? Uh, well, simplest, let's go back to the previous slide. So my claim is that the torus is, the diagonal torus that was on the previous slide means simply intersecting with Tn plus the big, uh, the dual of the free group. Why? Because, uh, well, the dual of the free group is somehow the biggest thing living there, the diagonal. So killing those diagonal things means, means to intersect with that. You, you get it's like absolutely equivalent to this definition. If you think that this, this intersection operation means to model by an ideal, that's exactly your, uh, your ideal. So now as you have this, of course, yeah, it works. So it's just a very basic knowledge of this intersection operation. So it works here. And uh, for the second part, reflection subgroups, uh, well, we get the same thing because uh, for the intersecting with KM plus won't change anything. So uh, these are the good things. So, okay, conclusion now. So, uh, building on what we had before, so we already had these four arrows, and now I have two more from u to t and from k to, uh, to t. Right? So, that's what we have. We have six arrows now. So, let's maybe remind. So, uh, the vertical ones use the isometric group of S, k must be the reflection group of t. Also, K is the reflection group of U, the intersection K and plus. Now, T already knew that it's uh, S intersection with T and plus, and we added these two things, which uh, mean that T is a diagonal torus of U and K. Okay, now what should we do next? Six, uh, we are at midway, right? <laughs> we must construct those correspondences, so what's easiest? Uh, Nothing is easy. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, with constructing u and k from t. Difficult question, but uh, these things are uh, they are no longer uh, available. So for this, we need to, to get into some quantum group methods, which are actually very advanced. It's called liberation theory, soft and hard liberation, to be more precise. So uh, once again, let's. Uh, be first in the abstract uh, setting. So I just take a usual uh, an arbitrary quantum group. T is the diagonal torus, K is the reflection subgroup, meaning uh, T is obtained by intersecting with this Tn plus, K is obtained by intersecting with uh, Kn plus. And we say that uh, so G classical is the classical version, right? Obtained by modding out by commutators. So we say that uh, this inclusion is a soft liberation where G appears from G class by taking the, the quantum group generated by G class and uh, K. And the hard liberation, if the, uh, the same thing is true, but with the torus. So, uh, well, this is liberation philosophy. I mean, this goes back to old work with, uh, with Roland Schweiker and uh, even before, I mean, yeah, to Wong papers, let's say, 30 years. And uh, there are many things that can be said about liberation. The idea is always to consider quantum groups and what we're doing as liberations of their classical versions. The problem is to understand how this liberation works. And soft liberation means that uh, the liberation appeared just by enlarging the reflection subgroup. And the hard liberation, which is stronger, means that the liberation appears just by enlarging the diagonal torus. 
that's all the idea. Now in practice, uh, you have also this diagram, which might be useful. So these are G and uh, it stores reflection subgroup. And these are the classical versions of everything. So this is an intersection diagram. Intersection, I mean, any square, the small thing is the intersection of the medium ones, right? T class for instance, is intersected, the intersection of T and K class. Also K class is G intersection G class. So this is an intersection diagram. So by definition, the problem is it's a generation diagram. Generation meaning that for any square inside, the big object is generated by the two medium ones. And soft liberation, you see, this means that the square on the right is a generation diagram. Hard liberation means that the whole rectangle is a generation diagram. It's stronger. So this is uh, we're, we're now in a bit into familiar territory. I mean, this kind of diagrams and squares, which are generation intersection, appear around the place in quantum groups. So that's uh, somehow uh, maybe yeah for those who have worked a bit maybe on this. That's uh, definitely uh, in familiar territory with this kind of squares now. You cannot go say more, but you know, say more here. So, uh, well, we're most interested in hard liberation, obviously. I mean, you see it in the torus here. So, we want to reconstruct UNK from T. So, that will be somehow the idea. Now, for this, uh, well, I did tell you first what's known about liberation. So, we need of this, unfortunately, it's very technical. So n plus n plus appears soft liberations uh, and also as hard liberation. So it's, not, it's enough to prove it for hard liberation, of course. And the hard liberation, uh, well, by standard arguments, it's enough to prove it for O n plus. And for O n plus, it's enough to prove, uh, well, you have to prove this by reference. There's no other known proof. And uh, you have to prove by reference from this. And this itself is a term of Kirby to recent uh, proof by reference. So, yeah, very complicated, but it's true. That's what we can say. Uh, now, three. Uh, three is clear. The reflection groups, of course. Soft liberation means to enlarge the reflection group. So, yeah, it's tricky out. But do not appear hard liberations. So, that, that's interesting. I mean, this. Uh, Hard liberation is not automatic at all. And why? Because this is wrong Weber stuff. They classified everything between um, H and A, H and plus, and uh, there is something there in between called H and infinity, which, uh, well, if you, if you blow up the diagonal torus at the biggest possible torus, you get to this H infinity, not H and plus, and it stops there somehow the liberation. So this is somehow wrong Weber stuff. And the uh, KNK KN plus is the same, we just complexify what they're doing. So, in short, uh, yeah, quite technical. But uh, yeah, that's it. Now, with this, we can uh, solve our problem. So, you have this formula here, which are just very nice. So, here you have ON all the time. And now, here you plug in the different tori, and you get your quantum groups. So that's the passage from the torus to the quantum groups, the generation would do n. So is this true? First formula trivial. Second one, uh, well, this is not trivial actually. Second one, so best is, uh, well, if you know a bit like the algebra, things like that, you know exactly that's uh, what's between on and un, and more precisely, ton inside un, uh, there's nothing in between. That's a uh, well known result. Now this guy here, ion generation with the complex torus, must sit between these two, so it must be yeah. That's the proof, so not exactly trivial. Three is the very hard thing, so this is uh, the Kirby result I was talking about. And four, uh, well, once you have three, you do some manipulations there, you get the, the four, two, it's not a problem. So basically you have this passage from the torus, from the Torah to the unitary groups, but in the free cases, yeah, you need all this recurrent stuff by here by C2. But, well, it's good. So you can add them, uh, these uh, generation formulas to, to what we have. So of course, if you can pass from the Torah to the unitary group, 
you can pass also to the reflection group by the same uh, method, right? Once you have this, this is trivial. So our diagram becomes like this. We have how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight correspondences. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out of 12. Very good. So we are left with three correspondences. So what to choose now? And the obvious choice is to go from, uh, from U to S, right? Because uh, in the classical case, there's just an homogeneous space. So let's do that now. So going from U to S. So in the classical case, uh, well, you can view this in several ways. So simplest is uh, just do something. I mean, you take one point there, for instance, one zero zero zero. That's on your sphere. If you rotate by uh, by U, you get the whole sphere, right? So yeah, that's how the sphere appears from the entire group. You just rotate a point. Now at a more advanced level, you can talk about homogeneous spaces. So you compute the stabilizer, and uh, that's it. The sphere is un uh, divided by un minus one. Now, uh, well, here uh, we need some function analysis uh, formulation. So, uh, for us, the best is to say that c of the sphere appears in size c of u uh, just by taking the first column of coordinates. Right? Well, you can take rows of columns for us, it's better columns for uh, some technical reasons later. So do it with columns. Normally, this is said with the sphere. I mean, if you take the first row of coordinates on UN, you get the sphere. But here, we'll do it with columns. It's, uh, it's better with columns. So uh, you see, this is good, because now this makes sense in the free case, too. You can take the first column space of uh, one plus n plus and see if you get the sphere. So let's uh, do some work in this direction. So first, uh, well, the first observation is that, uh, making uh, up here this column space, is that if you take the affine coaction map, which is on top, so I recall it, this is the universal affine, affine coaction map, we know that U is the quantum isometric group of S. So this is our phi. And uh, well, if pi is this, uh, this thing here, Pi of xi is ui1. This phi corresponds exactly to the co-multiplication. So, uh, well, why this is true, just check it on the generators. It's a one-line computation. So this means somehow it's a bit of an homogeneous space thing, what we have there. But uh, this is not enough, of course. So uh, let's go uh, more in detail now. So let's call SU the first column space of U of the entire group. I mean, I just take the coordinates from the first column, the algebra generated by them. It's a non commutative space. I call it SU. So, of course, it's a quotient space by definition because it's a subalgebra, a function algebra. And this is included into the sphere, right? That's uh, because these coordinates, they are. The sum of squares uh, is one for the for O n plus, and the similar thing for O n plus. So uh, the problem is to prove that this is an isomorphism, as you need to S. <coughs> so again, SU <coughs> S is, um, can be one of these pre spheres like here and complex different generators and relations. And the SU is the first column space. So you see it's not trivial, there's something to be done there. And uh, I must prove that it's an isomorphism. And remember, uh, everything that we're doing is up to the equivalence relation for uh, quantum groups, manifolds, which basically corresponds to the fact that full and reduced algebras must be the same. So our equivalence relation to be precise is that uh, the star algebras of coordinate might be isomorphic. So we'll prove that this uh, isomorphism with respect to that equivalence relation. So in order to do that, we'll uh, have to use the, <coughs> the higher integration. So remember, we have an arrow from U to S. So in the other sense, so you can go from C of S to C of U, and then integrate over U. So that's, uh, that's integration over S. Of course, in a classical case, you get the uniform measure. So let's work out that a bit. And uh, that will uh, solve our problem. 
So for that, we need the so-called Weingarten formula. We're getting again into advanced uh, technology. So um, to be more precise, the first thing we want to know about this integration is that it's ergodic in this sense. So that's the key result. And if you want to prove this, uh, you can't. You, you really need to know very well the integration over U. And this is given by this Weingarten formula. So I want to, you see, I want to integrate over the sphere, but the integral over the sphere appears by definition as a particular case of both integral of the unitary group. So that's why I need to know very well the integral of the unitary group. Unfortunately, that's possible. So uh, I told you before that U is easy, right? By some kind of Brouwer theorem, of Brouwer theorem. Now, what does that mean? So if you want to compute uh, an integral of something arbitrary of this type. Uh, well, these are coefficients of uh, u to the k, uh, u to the, yeah, k, let's say k is a color integer coming from the exponents there, k1, kp. So this integral is altogether by Peter Weyer from a projection onto the fixed points of uk. Now, by easiness, these fixed points are spanned by certain diagrams. To do something in our algebra, everything will depend on the gram matrix of these diagrams. To more precise, the gram matrix is this, if you compute the scalar product. And these integrals don't depend actually on gram, but rather on its inverse. That's the Weingarten matrix, the inverse. And the formula is like this. So it's some of these Weingarten uh, coefficients with some chronic error symbols. These are those, uh, the usual ones, as in the, the definition of laziness. So, what's the conclusion of this? We perfectly know what's the integration over, uh, over u. So this, of course, is the combinatorics that's uh, resolved by me and uh, the Bashish Koswami. You get this, that you have ergodicity. So uh, you see, it looks very simple. Uh, proof is complicated. Now, the ergodicity, you can do a lot of things. So first of all, let's do this. Uh, so the trace that uh, we constructed before is the unique uh, uniform uh, integration somehow in the sphere. So this is invariance under the, the universal coaction, the unitary group. So as this is true, uh, it's a simple trick based on ergodicity. Let's compute this quantity here. So you see if uh, this invariance condition is satisfied, I can do this, I get trace of x. On the other hand, by ergodicity, ergodicity means that this is this, I get integral of x. So trace is the integral. You see, it's a standard uh, function analysis trick. Once you have ergodicity, you have this, uh, this uniqueness. Now, getting back to our business, uh, yeah, so that's true. Uh, modulo or equivalence relation, the unitary groups make appear the spheres via this first column uh, space construction. So this once again comes from ergodicity, so from Weigarten. The idea is that, uh, so C, C like this calligraphic means uh, star algebra of coordinates, most functions. So phi is faithful. Now if I have this on the, on the star algebra, this means that the integral is also faithful, integral of uh, on, on S is faithful on the um, uh, star algebra. So this means that uh, we have equality up to the equivalence relation. So very good. Now, uh, yeah, we can reconstruct it one more arrow. So uh, from U to S, and uh, we're having eight of them, right? So that's the nines. So we have three arrows left from T to S and then S and K. And uh, well, here the situation is a bit more complicated. So uh, from T to S, you can do it by some kind of algebraic geometry, but uh, in the classical case, how to pass from the torus to a sphere, somehow you have to uh, remove the fact that the relations are unitary. I mean, there's some kind of algebra there which is needed and uh, unfortunately things are not yet very developed. I mean, this, this kind of free algebra and uh, this is not available yet. 
but no problem. I mean, uh, we don't want to do things perfectly, okay? So that's just uh, yeah, an introduction to the thing which is recent. So uh, you can go from T to S definitely, or you go via U or via K, whatever. Okay, so uh, there are no problem. And also the passage from S to K is quite tricky. Also in the classical case, you want to pass from the sphere to the hyperoctahedral group. It's in a real case, not very clear how to do it, and vice versa, not clear either. So we'll, uh, we'll just stop here. I mean, we did what we could, uh, even with very complicated techniques. And uh, we have nine correspondence, so the other three will just obtain them by, by composing. Okay, we'll cheat a bit. So, very good, we already know for the axiomatization. So uh, that was a slide that we had already. So uh, we are interested in quadruplets S, T, U, K, which are between uh, the real objects, classical, which are the smallest that we're interested in, and the free complex one, ones which are uh, biggest. Uh, with the assumption that S is algebraic, is needed. In what we did, quantum isometries of that that was needed, that it's algebraic, and you care quantum groups, and actually T being a quantum group means that T must be a group dual because it's uh, into group duals. And now here are our axioms. So I say that the quadruplet produces some kind of commutative geometry when we have uh, all these correspondences between them. So it's yes, that's exactly what uh, we're talking about before. You see S, for instance, is SU, that's the first common space construction. Uh, from T to the spheres, we're saying that we're almost cheat a bit, so uh, we'll just put here U by liberation must be ON and T, right? So I'll just put this. And uh, okay, so there are nine correspondences that we found, plus three more obtained by uh, composing. So yeah, G plus means isometry group, this generation things, everything is there, then some intersections. So everything was coming from intersection, generation, quantum isometry, and this uh, first common space construction. So they are all here. Now, of course, all this is, this, there are some things which are redundant. So if you want to compact form, a quadruplet between classical real and free complex, proceed on NCG1, so the sphere, yeah, let's look at this in detail. The sphere must be the first column space of the quantum group. Then the torus appears from the sphere or the reflection group by intersecting with the big, big torus, the dual of Fn. Now U must be generated by N and the torus, that's this liberation thing, and also must be the isometric group of the sphere. And finally K, is the reflection group of U and must be the quantum reflection group of the torus. And everything is taken up to the standard equivalence relation. For algebraic manifold, so you find it's not that complicated. I mean, it fits in one slide. <laughs> so, um, some comments on this. Well, uh, there are seven equalities to be checked, right? So, uh, the first one is by forgetting about the classical case where. Uh, well, we know a lot of things. In the free case, the first one is somewhat difficult, it's Weingarten. Second one uh, is trivial, this is trivial too. Everything intersection somehow is a trivial operation. Well, it depends. Uh, it depends, we'll see later examples where this might be not that trivial. This is hard, it's that skill was it to stuff. Quantum isometry was using this Bumi Goswami tricks, quite elementary. This is also Bumi Kozvami trees, but you, you end up with these twists and you have to intersect, so it's a bit more complicated. And this is once again trivial, but it's an intersection. So it's uh, yeah, a lot of tricks there. So the conclusion now, well, we have axioms, very good. <laughs> and uh, which can be probably improved a bit. I mean, uh, there are still some things we haven't talked about, especially that Torus gives the sphere, but uh, well, no problem, we have these axioms. For basic examples, and we're using what follows. I mean, uh, really, R and plus, and plus, and these spaces don't exist, but that's what we're doing here. We're axiomatizing these this things, these beasts which don't exist, by going one level below somehow at the level of S, T, U, K. 
Of course, we'll have more examples later coming soon. So the idea will be that next time we'll look for intermediate objects here and here and compose to also classify. So the results will be, the main classification result will be that under some the extractions will be mild, they are only nine geometries. I mean, the, here you have the half uh, liberated things. And here you have a kind of trivial hybrid scene between our complex and that solves so we get nice things. The technology is always saying, uh, yeah, you have to know, uh, besides basics, twisting for this piece of business, liberation, and why not? So it's very advanced. And finally, well, getting back to what we want to do. So next lecture, I will do examples classification. And then the, the other two lectures, well, we have to develop these geometries, right? And you know, this is very abstract for the moment. It's, uh, it's not non-commutative non geometry, it's um, somehow, well, it's non-commutative geometry about, uh, well, it's about Sarin somehow, and it's here. What we did today, somehow we found the axioms for what a kind of free RN or FCN should be or intermediate. So this is it, and we'll, uh, we'll see all this uh, next time.